So this session is about the urban potential of our industrial heritage. It will consider the role and the potential of, in, of industrial heritage in shaping and reshaping contemporary urban environments and landscapes. Um, and I think when I say urban, we also mean regional, you know, all, all kinds of built environments and landscapes. Uh, we'll consider strategies and approaches for engaging industrial heritage in the contemporary city um, and, in, and environments at a range of scales. Our speakers for this session are Emma Appleton, Mark Healy, Tim Greer and Sue Wood. And once again, I'm just going to introduce everyone now, um, have a short speak, um, uh, position piece from each of them and then some discussion and hopefully we'll be able to pick up on some of that discussion that we had um, just previously. And the other thing to note is that the lovely uh, University of Melbourne is providing a glass of wine and some nibbles for us at six o'clock and we will be able to continue the discussion over that as well. So when the seat gets a bit hard, just focus on that. <laughs> so Emma is a landscape architect and urban designer and is currently the director of the Victorian Design Review Panel at the Office of the Victorian Government Architect. Prior to this, she worked at CABE in London, leading the program of design support to the industrial towns and cities in the north of England as part of the Sustainable Communities Agenda. She was awarded a Churchill Fellowship in 2005 to explore the potential of post-industrial waterways in Germany and the Netherlands. Mark Healy is an architect and founding director of Six Degrees Architects, a practice that's well known for its inventive reuse of spaces, places and materials. Mark has been the design architect for many of the precinct revitalisation and hospitality projects by Six Degrees. Mark is going to begin by talking about the boat builder's yard here in Melbourne, but again, I'm sure his comment will expand well beyond that. Tim Greer on the end is the director of Tonkin Zalaka Greer, a Sydney-based architectural practice with an enviable record in transforming industrial spaces and landscapes. Two of their most well-known projects are carriage works at the Everly Rail Yards and the Paddington Reservoir Gardens. And today, Tim's going to begin by talking about Paddington and again, expanding out from that. And Sue Wood uh, here is, has, Sue has more than 20 years experience in strategic and statutory planning, urban design, heritage and community consultation. Sue has worked in consultancy and across both local and state governments, including the city of Port Phillip, where she was responsible for delivering the planning framework for the Port Melbourne foreshore urban renewal area. Sue has led multidisciplinary project-based teams on developing structure plans, urban design frameworks, planning policy and heritage guidelines. And today Sue's going to consider the larger precinct pr perspective by reflecting on Port Melbourne and its transition from an industrial area to mixed use. So we'd li I'd like to welcome Emma to begin. And How does this <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to uh, going to talk today about the Imsha Landschaft Park. I thought Angus was going to completely steal my thunder for a few seconds there, but I'm slightly worried he might know more than me about it. Um, the Imsha Landschaft Parks in the Ruhr in Germany. I won a Churchill Fellowship there in 2005, and since then, then have spent about three weeks there interviewing people, visiting sites, finding out how it all happened. Um, it was a project I heard about when I was doing landscape architecture in, um, in the 90s um, uh, and started with the International Building Exhibition in 1989 to 1999, uh, which was called the Emscher Landschaft Park. Uh, the Ruhr was one of the most industrialised uh, regions in the world at one time. Um, and uh, what was so intriguing about the place is the, the transitioning from this, the scale at which it happened was so immense and so massive. So it does have, I mean, the relevance that it has today is about the lessons learned from this to translate to, to our place, where the need is not so acute here, but the opportunity is as great. Um, so I've got six key things I want to speak about. Um, uh, lessons from this. I could speak about the Rua forever, but um, so but you're not going to. no. So that's why I've only got six key issues. So first of all, about understanding the scale of a heritage asset of a place. 
Um, and looking at that scale of opportunity at a regional, citywide and a neighbourhood scale to determine the approach to heritage as well as the level of ambition. Now, the Rua had over 5,000 hectares of uh, brownfield land, um, so they could not treat all sites the same. Uh, so the key, three key strategies they utilised were to demolish, uh, let it crumble, make it safe, Oh, sorry, number one was demolish, so key sites where they really needed to get rid of certain things. They took a strategic decision about that um, to let it crumble. The second one was let it crumble, make safe, give access, focus on landscape and the treatment of landscape, treat as landmarks, celebrate them through lighting, um, enabling access in certain places, what Angus was talking about. And lands, the Landshaft Park, Duisburg, Nord is one of, one of those... Um, where they did this really fantastic, a fantastic uh, landscape master plan by Peter Latz. Um, and then the third one was about celebration, finding new uses in places linked to culture, festivals, and as a foundation identity for new housing areas. So retaining gasometers like this one at Oberhausen, which is an art space, another gasometer is used as a scuba diving centre where they've sunk a ship within a gasometer and they do um, scuba diving training within that area within the gasometer. Um, just really creative, incredible interventions. Um, locations for special events. So really, the, you know, the, the quality of intervention in these places and the curation around bringing these places back to life um, in the psychology of that area was tremendous. So these, are, these sort of interventions, I think, um, just understanding scale issues is particularly relevant in places like the La Trobe Valley. I mean, it's still in use at the moment, but you, know, you go out there in the landscapes and the opportunity, thinking that through to the future and making that a really loved part of this state, I think would be a great thing. Um, second point, with industrial heritage, the importance of the built form to its landscape um, uh, its natural settings. Um, you know, the industry is so tied to the landscape, they're usually positioned because of the natural assets of landscape, and then they go through denuding it from then on. Um, and so what are the strategies to take the brown to green? And the landscape, the Emshire Landschaft Park was, took the view that landscape was actually, the greening of land, the green landscape was actually something that was quite cheap comparatively to built structure um, and could really start reframing how people felt about this place. Um, the strategy of the River Emshire actually calling the whole uh, international building exhibition, the Emshire Landschaft Park, the Landscape Park, was incredibly ambitious because the Emshire at the time they called it that was a, the industrial sewer, sewer really of the region and the locals thought they were mad but it was very like the, the strategy was very confronting and that was what they were going to that's what they were about they were saying this Emshire will one day be a natural asset and be the foundation of who we are into the future so they culverted all the industrial waste and then let the um, ground water actually be caught in this and that's an ongoing project that's being realized um, and it really has changed the, the feeling of how artists have been asked to reconsider places, industrial landscapes of great scale, so looking at the, spo the spoil heaps, how they could be re uh, reconsidered. Um, and I think this leads to my next point about the role and vision of the design, the role of having vision and having a really strong design proposition um, in aligning investment and bringing sites to realisation. The International Building Exhibition as a, a structure elevates the whole ambition of projects. It was led by someone who was a great leader who committed 10 years of his life to this region, Carl, I think his name's Dr. Dr. Professor Carl Ganser, something <laughs> like that. Um, and the role of the vision within this, looking at the whole region and how it connected and um, brought together the many fiefdoms. I think there were something like 19 local authorities, four municipalities, you know, regional municipalities. Um, and they had this great saying, I think it's, uh, I can not remember the German, uh, church tower thinking. That were not, they wanted to break the church tower thinking and the way they did that was have a really strong regional spatial strategy, but also realise projects in every municipality and in every um, uh, local authority area. 
Uh, and Carl Ganza believed in bringing forward design, to, you know, creative thinkers, designers, people to en who engaged in the built environment to work with the local knowledge base to see things with fresh eyes. And I think that maintained a, you know, maintained a momentum within the whole idea of the strategy. Um, this is one of the harbours where they've actually utilised a lot of the, uh, the heritage to, to, to be the, the sort of driver for the new residential areas. Um, the fourth point is it's all about connections, the people, um, the memories of these places in people's lives. I think, you know, they, they were starting, a lot of these environments were pretty impoverished to begin with because of the industries being in the area. Then they started demolishing the structures and the community felt like the, what they'd been involved in all their lives was being set aside. So it was very much about saying back to the community that you've given so much to this country, to this world, um, and really investing in projects which meant things to local people. So every project had relevance to its local population, but also added to the regional story and the Emshire Landshaft Park story, which I'll come back to at the end. And this was celebrated through festivals, um, you know, uh, the opening up of sites, as Angus was saying, um, to enable access to places that had only been ever accessed by people who were working within that factory or within that site, creating new destinations, um, just really building pride and social capital again um, once the industries had changed. There was obviously a lot of training programs as well about upskilling people within the MSHA um, to be able to um, come into the new economy. Um, but also the physical connections, and this was a key thing in the Bass, uh, the, the Bass um, Coast Trails, one of these 300 kilometres of bike paths, um, you know, really focusing on clean water systems. They put in so many bridges and each bridge has been designed uh, to be have an identity and so you know where you are on in the, that 300 kilometres. Um, and, and this was very much about connecting this industrial heritage and making it more than a sum of its parts. Um, I think the fifth point I want to talk about is the quality and diversity of inter intervention and the curation place. And we've heard a lot about sort of curation today as well of, of, of being, you know, really looking at an, uh, an opportunity um, and seeing how you can engage with that. But also what the Rua did very effectively is over the 10 years it was a festival and they change, everything changed. So you could go back and see things um, uh, growing and uh, different festivals, festivals occurring and they got great expertise in to help them do that. Um, so it's all about elevating the experience um, and being very much about high quality intervention. And then coming back to um, about telling the story loudly and collectively, locally, nationally and internationally. The EBA, the International Building Exhibition, really looked to talk and celebrate about the, in, this industrial heritage, what it had achieved, um, and, and really marketed that very strongly to its local people. When I was there, the, you know, one of the, the people who were in the next iteration of the IBA was talking about his biggest success is seeing German families on holiday there and spending a week of their lives in the Ruhr because back in the you know, uh, early, early 90s, you would never have imagined that that would have been a holiday destination and somewhere that where people wanted to understand that place. Um, so I guess I'm talking on the very big scale here, but it was just such an incredible, it's such an incredible project because of the scales of intervention and because, you know, just that re really big strategic thinking and that re visioning and design, um, but also the placemaking that's attached to that and it's incredible. So go, if you can. <laughs> oh, and who would have ever thought? So now we have Mark talking about a, a, a smaller intervention, but one which has much potential. Thank you. And thanks, Justine and um, Tanya and Helen, who I've had, who've been points of contact with um, all of this work. I've kept it pretty short because it was, um, we were asked to really put together a position statement. So how the thinking was how to six degrees as an architectural firm, how do we approach ideas of heritage? Um, but before, I've added a couple of things in the light of um, hearing the other speakers, because to sort of qualify what we do, we come, we formed an office um, 
as kind of half the officer, uh, the magpies of the world who love keeping the old things and the other half of the office like new things and like to clear the space so we can have the new things. So that tension that is the, the basis of um, adaptive reuse and heritage exists in our firm on a daily basis. It's been doing it for 20 years. Um, because a lot of our early projects were, was an architecture built from um, building skips, those receptacles out the front that go to landfill at a building site. So from that sort of world of um, form follows found object, <laughs> that's where our kind of heritage comes from. But there's six points, and in relation to this project, this is a little, um, a little bit of the Yarra River that was um, kind of saved. It's part of the old southern good sheds area where boats, sailing boats, unloaded cargo um, and it was sorted and sent elsewhere. Um, pretty simple stuff and a lot of it, the, the piers, the boardwalks, is all, it's all been um, restored. We were invited to look at this this kind of maritime precinct by the main developer, the plenary group, who did the entire convention centre and the whole catastrophe around there. And we were asked to look at the, um, just these, the, the old maritime museum shed and another shed that was Shed 9, was known as, um, and a, client, a couple of our clients looked at it as a possible hospitality venue. So, you know, we had a look at it. So I've got six points as well, Emma. But point one is look at something with open eyes and an open mind, because um, sometimes you really need to strip back a few layers to get to the good stuff. So this was kind of day one of getting to the site. This is five or so years ago. And there's a whole lot of um, kind of junk and rubble around and a building or two mixed in with it. So that's just, that's point number one. Point number two, or the position, um, kind of let the old building tell its story. You know, in brackets, keep it real. Um, the, the sheds themselves were completely disassembled, taken away, stripped of asbestos, uh, lead paint, the whole lot, um, and then put back on site exactly as they had been there. And it was um, very well done. Bruce Trethowan was the heritage architect on the project, and I think Bruce did a great job. So, you know, there's nothing that flash about these sheds, but if you look at it, um, brings me to kind of point number, uh, I'll jump to point number four, but lots of small detail can tell a big story. Okay, this one relates to the next one, which is about um, keeping, you gotta keep a building kind of relevant to the time you're in, well, 2013 now. Um, and don't kind of be afraid of looking at new and different uses, which has been discussed as well. So here's our little shed once the rubble's been cleared and this background sea of glass and modernity. So we're thinking about how this, how this little guy can um, do something in the space. The, our, our precinct, the area we kind of controlled was about 2,000, a bit over 2,000 square metres which is a reasonable size, but in the scheme of it, it's, it's quite a small area. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, a, a lot of the other cargo sheds in that area fell to the kind of grandpa's axe syndrome. You know, five new heads, three new handles, it's my grandfather's axe. And, you know, they'd been kind of, insulated and plastered to death and reclad in new and with every kind of intervention uh, you get the life sucked out of it so let's just I'll come back uh, that's an interior of part of this shed and really it looks like nothing much has changed and it you know we had to kind of fight to keep the old nuts and bolts sticking out of the old hardwood and the splinters and the little chalk remarks, you know, Barry, don't forget to turn off the whatever. that was probably written 80 years ago. Um, 
and all these little details were retained and the kind of um, that's kind of item number five of the position which is respect the old buildings and try not to overwhelm them with uh, the inter intervention that you're going to make that you're going to make and this one relates to point six which is um, I'll have to go back to point two in a minute, but point six is about don't be afraid to get out the scalpel. Um, you know, it's, we can't treat, we've got to be pretty selective about what is a great example of an era, why is it great, the whole, um, the architectural, social, historical, uh, the memory meaning to everyone involved in it or to a, to a bystander. Um, you've got to isolate that stuff. Well, I'm not a great fan of keeping everything, but it's um, but back to point number one. You've got to look at it and really carefully look at something to see if it's got opportunity. Um, we like old stuff because of the inbuilt stories of what these buildings can tell. Um, there's a richness and a layering in old buildings that. Um, it's like Lunig with his funny device to get the stories, you know, you clip it on and you can get all the stories out of the, the old cafe tables. Um, you know, architecturally, there's an element of that um, in adaptive reuse. So it's more than just going back or forward. So this is the old shed as it operates. It's, um, you know, it's a cafe precinct. Architecturally, part of the detailing of all the, the new pavilions and other areas um, takes a lead from the aesthetic and the materiality um, of what was there previously. Like if we kind of really looked at how the wharves were put together and the old railings and bits and pieces, and that's been integrated into it being a hospitality venue in, um, you know, in this century. You know, it's got a kind of certain robustness to it. That um, it's like you don't fight the building, you fight for it, but you kind of let it inform you about how you're gonna, in a modern way, kind of mesh in and let it talk. Because it's doing you a favor. It's putting the first line on the canvas and saying, well, psh, now you fill in the rest. And we kind of like that. Um, and that's probably five minutes. Lovely. Done. Um, well, it's a thrill to be part of such a relevant uh, discussion, especially you think that it's happening now. I think that's completely brilliant that this is happening. And this image is really just to put my words into an architectural concept, a, a context. This is the sort of work we do. Um, much of it uh, adaptive reuse and some of it uh, new. Um, but a discussion such as this uh, needs to start with a long view. Uh, and in the case of the Paddington Reservoir Gardens, which was the conversion of an 1860s, 1870s water reservoir into a new park for the city of Sydney, and we need to look at the city as the starting point. Um, buildings aren't objects in their own right. Uh, they can't escape being part of an urban setting, a, a landscape, a social network, or in fact, a moment in time. Um, a city can be thought of as an evolving organism, uh, ever-changing, thriving and dying, uh, receding and regenerating. Um, this is especially true of heritage buildings, and I'm fascinated by this idea of the continuum uh, based on the notion that historic and contemporary cultures are interconnected. Uh, there's a continuum upon which contemporary culture sits, and of course it's just the brightest light uh, of, of the moment. Uh, the notion of a compilation of history, uh, history is all around it, around us, and of course it is in our, our present world. And there's a physical connection in changing something from one state to another. A new relevant use and habits, uh, an urban artefact, an object imbued with urban memories. Uh, somewhere between the new building that is relevant to us now uh, and the urban artefact representing our past, there's a third ethereal building that no one can quite put their finger on. The architectural strategy for the Paddington Reservoir Gardens is underpinned um, by the notion that the architectural concept for the new use is lurking within the artefact. Uh, the architect becomes a detective searching uh, for evidence and inspiration in the history and form of the architect. Uh, 
this is what we found, essentially just a chaotic mess, uh, but this is what it was meant to be. The pinnacle of British infrastructure engineering transplanted to the colonies, uh, sort of a series of repeated fault, vaults of perfection. Um, and there's often a vast gap between the experience of the inherited artifact uh, and the original intention. And something I love to do is actually to delve into what was the original intention of that building at its time of uh, conception. So returning to this idea that the architectural concept for the new use lurks within the artifact, the strategy allows for contemporary expression of new use, um, but introduces aesthetic common territory of past and present to meet. And it's the tension between the past and the present that generates the architectural expression of the third ethereal building. The overriding aim is to form a continuum of past and present without one dominating the other. Uh, this conceptual idea is manifest in such a way that the fragmentary spatial richness uh, of the ruin became the spatial ordering system of the park. The material, materiality of a new building is based on the hierarchy of the existing reservoir. The existing building's limited palette of three materials, a brick, uh, cast iron beams and wooden columns, um, uh, are matched with three contemporary materials, steel, concrete, and aluminium. The inherited vaults were amplified uh, either by uh, extending up out of the ground plane or capped with level concrete slabs. Uh, the, the new sunscreen matches the scale of the vaults by conceptually extracting uh, the mortar from the brick vaults and transferring them uh, into a pattern of aluminium. And here we see uh, the past and the present intention. Uh, the new gates are detailed as fragments. Uh, and the eastern chamber uh, was restored as an urban room. This was the only part of the uh, reservoir that we found uh, in, uh, that was predominantly intact. And one of the things I find particularly fascinating about these sorts of infrastructure uh, projects, factories, when they are converted into the public domain, the inside becomes public uh, space. And what was historically uh, a domain only for the workers that had lots of symbolism around it, the general public were excluded. There's this wonderful moment when the general public who have had years of uh, curiosity, I guess, uh, can actually come into these, these buildings. And continuing this narrative, um, the plant selection uh, by landscape architect Anton James is based in the fashionable plant selection at the time of the reservoir's construction in the 1860s and 1870s. And uh, by way of conclu conclusion, never ceases to amaze me of how well adaptive reuse projects are received by the broader community. And I think it has something to do with the retention of the perceived consciousness and memory of those sites, even though a shiny new partner has arrived. Um, and in adaptively reusing a building, we can magically transcend time uh, as more than one generation can be represented at once, which of course is why we must represent our generation. Thank you. I think it's very interesting to, to switch scales from the sort of major sort of strategy, strategic vision to the um, very significant projects, but which are, you know, and are thinking of themselves very much within the city. I mean, both of your projects, I think, are very um, clearly uh, have urban ambitions, ambitions for the city, ambitions for the inhabitation of the city. Um, and I think, you know, Boat Builders is really remarkable to me, partly for the way that the pedestrian can just sort of wander through in a way that none of those other shed re sheds which become bars or restaurants really facilitate. So you're kind of making some movement. You know. So there's urban gestures, I think, in both of these projects which are quite significant. And there's the sort of big picture strategy that you're talking about. And then in some ways, a sort of a, a kind of big picture strategy which falls down in those individual projects. So, well, maybe in those examples in those yeah. examples of those individual projects so i think it's a really nice mix here and i guess the thing i really want to do ask emma is knowing what you do about <laughs> victoria um you know emma and emma is see you how many projects have you seen through the vdrp now i've done about 60 reviews so 60 reviews of projects across the state and i think in in finding those projects you have a very 
substantial understanding of what's going on across the state in, in a kind of maybe project by project basis. But not, so, and we have things like Fisherman's Bend coming up. We, as you said, the Latrobe Valley, there's major opportunities. How do we put strategies and structures in place that, that, that facilitate the kinds of projects that, that um, Mark and Tim talk about? What do we do? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I'm I interested mean, to you. To, can you take that, bring that knowledge, cross, cross, you know, cross it with your knowledge of Melbourne? I know you don't want to answer this question. <laughs> I think uh, one of the things I felt found very compelling about the MSHA was around that it was, uh, you know, it was, it was higher than any state power, and it was, it wasn't, it didn't have any legislative power or any statutory power. It was very much about, well, what are we going to do with what we've got? Um, and, you know, it started the thing about the scale of change. I think what happens often is there'll be neighbourhood-based plans around heritage buildings. There'll be maybe city-wide. But then really thinking about that in that broader context and being deliberate about strategies. I mean, we haven't seen many um, projects through of, of the na industrial heritage nature as yet. It's been a lot of... Um, we've focused on state government projects, generally you know, health education, those sort of things. A lot of growth context. Um, but we're hoping to see more now that we've opened to local authorities. But I think the thing is, when it comes down to a site by site basis, you're going to have these incredible places being created, but they'll be very particular to that place. But it's about how they then all connect up to everything else that's going on, mm. um, which I think, you know, mm. is your point that rather than, than being subsumed into general, you know, residential led commercial development, that they actually start standing proud within that framework because you know what you've got, you know what you're keeping, you know what you're going to mm. celebrate. So it's it's that kind of that maybe it's a state government should really um, look to to help councils sort of join up a bit more about what they're all trying to achieve. And so it stops being about sites or neighbourhoods, but it becomes that next level up of well, what are we as a city? And I think there are some great examples of you know yeah, particularly you know Bendigo, Ballarat where the, the heritage is very much part of the, the place and the character and very well celebrated, um, and very much about the identities of those places. I, want, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, this isn't about, fair. No, no, about <laughs> how the Germans kind of were strategic. If they said, um, OK, we have six glass factories that are derelict in this area, do they say, let's look at the best one and keep it, you know, and we'll demolish the others and... Um, you know, redevelop, or because you mentioned sort of Ballarat, do we need six um, sovereign hills, or do, can we do all right with just one good one? It's that. Well, I think there was a political aspect to this as well, I guess, in that there were, say, I can't remember the exact figure, about 19 municipalities, and they were very keen to make sure that every municipality had something incredibly special which meant things to that local population. So that was one of the, the sort of strategies. They, they made sure that every place had some form of intervention that was very special. So that might help in their decision making mm. about which to go, which was to stay, um, level of remediation. So real practical things fed into it. Um, the scale of some of these things, again, fed into mm. it. Um, but yeah, I, I think there were many levels to it, but there was a political thing to say, well, if we're going to keep these municipalities working together, we've really got to make sure there's a project delivered every year in every municipality, which is celebrated by the local people and adds up to our vision. So um, that was kind of one of their strategies for making sure that it was... So I'm not sure, have I answered your question? Yeah, kind, kind of, of. Yeah. Thanks, mate. Well, no. yeah. I mean, I think the thing that's... There's no answer. No. What's particularly... I mean, an incredibly positive aspect of uh, inheriting a building on a site is the form is already there. So a lot of the debate about the form, and often these forms are very large forms, so that, um, you know, when you do a new building, often the large uh, battle is about what, what should the form of that building be? How big should it be? And so all of that debate goes away when you've inherited a building. And so you can actually start to look at more interesting things that are more relevant to its, its context and its area. And actually try and actually key, and I think that's why a lot of adaptive reuse projects do really speak to the areas that they're in. Although it is a bit scary that there's, there's now, I guess, 
people have been doing this for 20 or 30 years, that there are a number of kind of set pieces that people will do with an adaptive reuse building. I think they've got to be avoided at all costs. Um, because you've seen them in the other adaptive reuse building, which is 10 miles away, so suddenly your building loses its, um, its relevancy to its context because it's being, um, I, I guess, diluted by previous, previous strategies. But I think the other thing that's fairly clear in that presentation and um, is that uh, publicly funded adaptive reuse projects have a much better chance than privately funded because they don't uh, suffer the commercial constraints of um, developers who, and we all love to blame the developers, but actually they're just the front people for the banks. The banks are demanding a 22% uh, internal rate of return. That's what drives those kind of horrific forms that, that we see. Um, and I think um, what's so interesting about um, you know, the, the, boat, the boat builder's yard is it's part of a commercial development, but it's actually, it's a kind of quasi, well, it's, it's a very public building. And I suspect, and I'd be interested to know, know about this, of whether the, the kind of funding of that is actually wrapped up in a much bigger financial equation. So those projects probably didn't have to return a financial return in their own right because they were um, the carrot for the big development and I think that's the other really uh, interesting card we have to play when we're adaptive re reusing a project is that uh, we're working on a huge project in Sydney and the first, uh, the first project that was discussed was the adaptive reuse of a laneway. Um, because it existed, people could identify it and we could talk about it, whereas none of the other stuff had happened. It then got completely shelved to five years later. And now we're having this kind of um, uh, Herculean battle because it's supposed to make a, a return in its own right. And of course it never can and it never should because it was the kind of sacrificial lamb that got the consent for this enormous building behind. So there's a whole, you know, there, there, there is a, a lot of politics um, tied up. And I, I was just going to say, uh, because we, you know, we visit a lot of regional towns and cities as well, and one of the things, a lot of heritage sites are owned by um, quite big landowners who are holding them and basically waiting until the time is right to bring them forward for residential development. Yeah. Mm. Um, and that's, that's blighting towns, it's making the potential for what they can be in the future very difficult to you know, retain what's wonderful about them now. Um, and it, you know, in some places I've visited that I've just thought, you know, that whole story may be gone if mm. government mm. doesn't do something about it. And, but then, you know. I think, I think there's room to actually kind of formalise aspects of um, doing deals with developers. This might sound mm. like shaking hands with the devil, but um, sort of Sue's examples of some of those old warehouses that were completely kind of consumed by, you know, this growth mm. coming out of them, that you could kind of formally say, well, within this land parcel or this building type, um, you know, the retention or the, you know, the, the kind of clever adaptive reuse of this bit will give you kind of credits to develop another part of a site, um, you know, more generously. Uh, yeah. I think it's, there's room for it. If it's done well, there are examples of it. And, and a lot of cities have, um, you know, air rights over heritage buildings. So you can buy a heritage building and if you can't maximise the site because you have a heritage building, you can then sell that space. And the going rate in, in the Sydney CBD is about $1,500 a square metre. So you can actually get a very good return out of it. But, I mean, really, there's, there's two mutually exclusive kind of um, forces operating on most heritage buildings. One is um, the importance of the importance that the new use is an appropriate use for that building. If you go to put a block of units inside a huge, great space, you lose lose the huge great space, it's an inappropriate use. The other other thing is the financial equation, which is, and this is the rural example, where um, somebody's sitting on a building, they're just waiting for the land value to get to a point, and that meets the bank's financial model. So therefore, in the developer's eyes, that's uh, an appropriate use. So, so when we talk about appropriate use, we're talking about an urban level at, at, at the city, the way the city lives and breathes as a, as a kind of a uh, as a being. Um, and then the, the kind of 
The banking sector looks at it as a set of numbers, but unfortunately, as a community, we have vested our development to the capitalist financial model, and we we're... have to smash the banks. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we want, that's that's what we have said as a society. We want so, uh, and, and I think that's one of our big roles as architects is to actually be politically very astute and to work out where the opportunity is for the old building because you're actually playing you're playing with those two models, and very seldom do those two models align. I suspect the boat sheds is one of the very few examples, and that's why you see the really good examples are all public public money, you know, such as the Ruhr. Real Valley. So, uh, you know, it's it's that's I think the the, the reality of the, the landscape that we work in. Yeah, could I just make um, two points about um, the Port Melbourne experience? One was the um, the limitation of the planning tools that were available, and when it was rezoned from industrial to mixed use zone, the mixed use zone actually facilitated the highest and best use was residential development, which was as of right. So it went from being um, a, a highly industrial area through to this sort of mono almost residential area with nothing in between. So that, that was an issue that we didn't have a zoning and it's what Alini also referred to. There wasn't a zoning that um, preferenced other uses as well, so the highest and best use always won out. Um, the other thing is in these urban renewal precincts, when you are rezoning from industrial to, for example, mixed use, there's a, a si significant increase in land value. And if there could be some sort of betterment levy or um, some way of capturing some of that money that could then be used for heritage or other public benefit purposes, that would be um, you know, another way of trying to tackle it. Rezone. Or even just a mechanism yeah. that allows the form of those heritage buildings to be retained. Because you know, quite a few of the examples that you showed, they're just the form had been completely eroded and they just yes. built on top because that's where the views were, mm -hmm. etc. Yeah. So the, yeah, that's, that's, and that's where that um, floor space uh, thing is a very powerful tool because mm. you keep the form, the form, mm. you sell the space. It's a very easy development. You don't actually have to do anything. It's mm. just you know, it's it's a trading system. Yeah. But rezoning seems like a terribly blunt instrument in a very mm. complex situation. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't understand quite what's going on in Fisherman's Bend, but it seems that rezoning has been the blunt instrument that's used there as well. And I don't know if you're can talk as a private individual about that at all, but it's also, I suppose, a matter about how institutions and governments learn. So having done Port Phillip, having, are there, um, which is a pretty enlightened council in many ways, um, does, I mean, you might be able to reflect on what might have been done differently, but I mean, is there a thing where the government itself should be doing kind of post-occupancy evaluation almost of these precincts and the systems and structures that we used yeah. and learning from those as yeah, new... That, that would be useful because we continue <laughs> to make the same mistakes. Yeah, that's what I... <laughs> so we are, yeah, OK. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, we need to just protect a lot of the stock before we... You know, it's sorted out. Mm. I mean, because it's once it's gone, it's gone. We haven't once it's rezoned. There's it's not gone. much great old fabric really lying around. Mm. So and what's wonder, there? I also wonder with Port Melbourne, um, individual buildings had heritage overlays, but there wasn't a sort of precinct-wide um, mm. opportunity to say we're co we're concerned about this whole area and its thematic history. Mm. So each building was the battle yeah, yeah. and they were pissed yeah, off the one by one yeah. Yeah. rather than having this more holistic view like with the rural where you've got a a, 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 a better strategy in place to look at the whole mm -hmm. and then each part within it. And then I think once it gets down to a site based discussion particularly when it's mm. a residential led mm -hmm. you kind of it's going to be tough and you'll end up in VCAT and the developer will go try you know a mm. bit higher and they'll end up in the middle bit and it'll be a bit rubbish. I think another issue too is within local government there, there aren't um, sort of property analysts so you, you might have your urban designer and your place manager but you actually need someone either in-house or 
like a heritage advisor, but they're a property advisor who can who can um, dissect what a developer is putting on the table to tell you whether their claims of economic viability are, are genuine or not, or um, come up with ideas about how that could be changed or manipulated. And you, you almost need that expertise now. It's becoming so I mean, complex. There's possibly a kind of in-between phase, and that's where the control is written for a, a, a precinct or an area, and then it's kind of road tested by a series of, um, you know, um, you could, for example, have a large site that's been rezoned. You know, it's, it's had the the primary infrastructure has been put in place, and then half a dozen architects could do very um, simplistic uh, charrettes or, 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 sch or schematic designs to actually road test those planning controls. What, where are you going to get to? Because the minute, because often, you know, I suspect, well, I, I don't know, but often with a lot of these sites, then people, it's all kind of done um, in a roundabout sort of planning way. And then when you get, uh, it actually, it, so it's written in the abstract. It's a theoretical construct of what, what the capacity of a piece of land is. It's not actually until you test it with, with an architectural proposition, you actually see whether it's right or wrong, whether it's too big or too small, or it's undervalued or it's, or it's overvalued. And I suspect that under overvalue thing is not actually a relevant factor because the land value will just be the byproduct of the capacity of the land. And um, that, that then the quality of the development is actually driven by the financial model. And that's another problem that we have all the time that you can come up with a really beautiful design that works really well it's, it's, it's intense, it's dense but it has a series of um, construction characteristics that make that a viable proposition mm. but of course that's an expensive proposition and that gets eroded through through the process so what you end up with is not what you started with. And with industrial heritage you, you often have issues such as contamination mm. which really yeah. kind of blow those financials yeah. and other kinds of ways. But again you can deal with those by mm. taking those out at the beginning mm. and yeah. you know, not putting that risk onto the developer. Sure, let's... one problem coming through and that is the one of cost and expense and they are quite natural um, factors if we're concentrating on the big cities having yeah. crossed the continent by train in two directions recently and going down to the Latrobe Valley very regularly uh, I see that there are tremendous tremendous scope there yeah. Yeah. with the Rua uh, that was the target for tonight for the for the air forces during World War II and maybe they start with a clean slate, but they're not uh, inhibited by um, what's this land going to be worth? And no, they're not, because they do have a very different get. valuing mm. system We've in got terms a, of land. A pretty big space out there and some pretty interesting things where it doesn't have to be a broken hill mine. Um, it can be something in other springs or there's plenty of space in between. And uh, little things I see are being done there, and I just wonder if we shouldn't widen our horizons a bit more. Sure. I mean, when we put the case studies together, we looked quite hard for projects in regional locations, and and we d we didn't have a great deal of success. And uh, the comment that I kept getting from people was, "There's so much space. There's no need to redevelop because, and there's no and the land value is not there, so there's no impetus to redevelop." But I absolutely agree. Um, but it was something we looked for, and I have to say, we didn't really find a great deal of um, but I, I agree I think it's easy it, it, in some ways perhaps we're talking about inner urban areas because the pressures seem seem strongest but um, we never had it going for Sunday afternoon drives or we used to we're looking for something wider than that mm. yes I, th I do think there's a oh sorry Helen <laughs> so, uh, let's open to the floor now I think so, um, I just wanted to raise another issue um, that I found in a lot of projects there is this time lag where developers take the property and then we have the, the planning phase and everything else and many years go past. And I think one of the things that I really struggle with is the um, deliberate or semi-deliberate leaving open of buildings to neglect and to be run down. And so even um, in my own projects, um, I've gone back to look at a building and it's been vandalised, you know, it's had fires in it, the roof's left off, the water's gone right through the building and everything. 
And then I turn around to my client and say, well, you know, we argued for the offset. You got the big bit over here because you were going to conserve this bit and interpret this bit. And, and you know, it's hard to know how genuine people are, but they say, but look at it now. It's going to cost us so much more. It's, in, you know, it will never conform to the building code now. So somehow we've got this problem um, and, you know, I, I call it the donut because it often seems like the heart of the thing that I'm trying to keep gets lost while all these things happen around the edge. But I think the issue of demolition by neglect is a really big one for us at the moment and fits in very much um, with what was being discussed. Um, I don't know how you control it because it's separate from the mechanisms of the wider sort of statutory um, area, but I don't know if anybody's got any good examples or good suggestions, but I think that's factory horrible. Which one? The Eager Factory is probably the worst example of recent time. And yes. in fact another subcommittee of the Heritage Council has been in these it's not the Heritage Council is people might be able to say more about it, but they are doing, just as you've opened up this, I guess, through a subcommittee of the Heritage Council, yeah. um, um, they're also looking at this. And I think local government as well, I don't know if anyone's here from Hobson's Bay, but they've um, specifically included demolition by neglect in the planning scheme, and, you know, I've just been thinking that arguing that case and everything, but it's just a really hard tool um, to try and deal with it, and it's hard to know um, how deliberate it is because we all know it's an empty site, a site without a caretaker, without a temporary use, is a site that's very hard to protect. I think this could very easily <laughs> turn into um, something around all the problems of which I know there are many, um, and so I, and I do and I think that that's useful. But I think what we also really want to do is find strategies to kind of make or make you know find ways of finding opportunity and strategies to proceed. And ideally, we would like the government probably to take a stronger hand. But even if they don't, I suppose it's really about trying to find strategies at all kinds of levels to have it make an impact. And I think, um, I mean, I agree, Tim, that, that government money makes things easier, or well, not easier, makes things possible in some contexts. But I also, from what I understand of Paddington, you guys had to fight very hard to have that ruin turned into yeah. a park and not yeah. just capped over. So the plan, as I understand it, the brief was to cap it over and put a park on top and yeah. you guys saw an opportunity, fought very hard to make that happen. So I, you know, I think there are also these sort of moments of hope where people see opportunity and really, you know, strategize hard to make something yeah. happen and become precedents which hopefully will, you really know, build momentum. The design and proposition. I mean, the, the really amazing thing about now is that a lot of people uh, like the idea of keeping something. They know it's not perfect, um, may not be intact, but there's a kind of a, you know, because the, they know that, you know, that part of the city with the memories and associations or whatever stays there for lots of people. And I think that, that's, not a, that's not a battle with anybody. You know, mm. Most people would prefer to keep something, you know, I mean, if you want to generalise. The, the really interesting thing about the city of Sydney is that's just an incredibly enlightened mm. client. Yeah. Um, they were big enough to actually have somebody propose an alternative to their brief and say, this is a possibility. And there were lots of reasons why they shouldn't have done it. It was public open space, parkland below street level. Um, all sorts of water issues, um, ironically, but, um, <laughs> but and, and you know, the, the people inside of council, they helped us. You know, when we said, look, 
we've got this brief, but actually uh, there's, a, there's a park at either end of Oxford Street, so what are we building another park for? There's a ruin, Sydney doesn't have any ruins, it's a young town. Um, it would be great to have something that kind of keyed into its, its history and its infrastructure. And they got it instantly, but they said, oh, how do we get it through this political process? So we, it, and that was very complicated. We had six schemes. We had five fake schemes that were all about <laughs> uh, manoeuvring it through different, different departments. And then ultimately it went to the mayor and she got it instantly. She just said, uh, uh, like the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, and we just agreed completely. <laughs> and um, then she mentioned another set of gardens that nobody had ever heard of, and I'm not sure they exist, but we also agreed with it, absolutely. <laughs> and it was her political will that made it happen. And um, she, she just said, um, you know, because one part of the council saying you can't do it because you've got public space below street level, it's dangerous, vagrants, recalcitrants, all of that sort of stuff. And uh, you know our proposal was to put gates on it, and, and there's a park 300 metres up the road that gets locked up every night. And she just said, the same person will just get that man, and the city council will pay him to do the padding and reservoir gardens <coughs> on his round. So he is, he goes around Centennial Park. Now he just does a little loop uh, around. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a really gorgeous story about the park that um, we we we'd always talked about it as a set of urban rooms so that it, it, it was an open space and that was one of our other really strong arguments that it should be an anti suburban park, you know, Sydney, like any Australian city is full of suburban parks which just open a ring of trees around the edge if you're kinda of lucky. Um, and we said, let's not make it that let's make it a series of rooms. So this idea of urban rooms is kind of the the, the notion of the sort of intimate civic spaces. And um, as an extension of that, we proposed a set of seats. So instead of park benches, they should have seats, chairs that people could move around and put in the sun. And the council went out and bought 12 seats. Um, <laughs> we couldn't believe it. We thought that that's not going to go anywhere. <laughs> they bought 12 seats, and somebody wrote an article a couple of years ago about the life of those seats because uh, they've been there for several years and they haven't been stolen. And this journalist found out that they had been stolen because. There were some students quite nearby, they must have been very affluent students, but they were having a dinner party and they pinched four seats, they took them to their dinner party and then they brought them back the next day. <laughs> <laughs> so it's quite cool. So those seats had a little, little adventure, but they're still there and it's kind of really, really lovely. It gives you a lot of, um, it's a really, it makes you very optimistic about a city yeah. and I know it's a very wealthy part of Sydney and all that sort of stuff and it's well looked after because it's a really good council, but it does make you very optimistic that, that you actually can, as an architect, Proposed civic ideals, they can be implemented and they can be um, successful. So it's kind of uh, fabulous from that point of view. Yes, I think we need to sort of balance between if we're not optimistic, nothing, we can't make anything happen, but also being very realistic about the kind yeah. of complex constraints that one has to navigate to be mm. optimistic. Do we have any more questions from the floor? Ginny? I've just got a comment, and I think what Kim, you've just been saying is fantastic, and also about having the need to have these really very um, exemplary projects. Because having spent a little while in Queensland, the, the, issue, the issue there is that you, you said people just want to keep things well in Queensland they're done. Mm -hmm. And where there was quite a lot of um, support for heritage, I could just see it fading away. And I wasn't a Queensland heritage person, right. so it was very yeah. Yeah. difficult. So I think it's that, that sense, but if, if people can say, oh, they did that in Sydney, mm. so we'll, we'll do it here. I mean, there is that kind of sense that we mm. should be thinking about how these exemplary projects travel mm. because everybody needs help. And I mm. currently think that in Queensland, the Heritage Group needs help, but mm. there might be other people who know better. Mm. But well, um, I just think that this is why these connections between what are these exemplary projects and the fact that you've done mm. these case studies how they kind of keep going out and how people can see that they can do that too. Well, I think that was exactly Helen's motivation for, um, for setting them up. And, you know, a couple of people have said we kind of went beyond the scope, and that was because the scope was for a very small project description for each of them. And we simply, the issues were more complex, and I'm sure that everyone involved will read their two, you know, their two pages and go, oh, it was so much more complex. We know that. I, but we had tried to outline the challenges and the opportunities and the... Um, you know, kind of 
what happened out of that in a way that at least there's some point of access for other people thinking about what to do next. And I think it's been a fantastic project, thanks to Helen. Um, and I think it was a really good idea to do that. And, and they will, they're available online. And so the idea is that then anybody can access them. And they you know, we're, we're not trying to speak to, although of course, I mean, I think if a heritage expert reads them, they'll go, well, we know all this, but we're, then we're not actually trying to speak only to heritage experts. We're trying to speak to a much broader community who might. Well, that's the, the mm. very thing about Queensland, is mm. that it is the community, it's the, it's the, it's the people who are mm. losing interest. Mm. Mm. And the heritage people are, are not losing interest. So I think, however, you start to get that through in a community sense, mm. this, this mm. going to be where things shift. And I, and I, as I said, I'm only speaking about Queensland because they kept saying, oh, Melbourne knows how it works. Victoria knows everything. That's all right. You should just follow what they do there. So there's this very critical moment of community um, support that we probably need to do. Mm. Yeah. Can, can I, I just dob someone in for one of the case studies? My partner from Six Degrees, Peter Malat's over there, and he was... He Hi, Peter. did the project for its case study um, 11, the an old uh, rail shed in Tasmania that's now the architecture school. So if anyone wants to know about that. Yeah, yeah. Is so you going to stick around for a minute? Yeah. And actually that's... It's Peter because it's an amazing project. Yeah. Yeah. And another thing we looked a lot for and didn't find so much of was, was um, 20th century and particularly post-war examples of reuse of post-war heritage. Um, but look, it's six o'clock when there's probably a glass of wine out there. So um, it feels like it could go on for much longer. I don't think we've nailed any answers, but we have started a conversation. So thank you all for coming. And thank you.